Okay, good afternoon. Thank you for the introduction. And I think I will ask some of the kids to come and give my talks because they are really, really good. So I'm, I was very impressed. Um, so this afternoon I'll talk about Aster yellows phytoplasma. And uh, Aster yellows are caused by phytoplasma, which are some kind of bacteria. And uh, they are obligate parasites, meaning that they can only survive either in the plant or in their insect vector. They cannot survive outside of their host. And because they are also non-cultivable, they can only be characterized with molecular characteristic, molecular tools. And we have seven groups in Canada. So where do they come from and what are the vectors? So the main vector is the migratory Asterlifoper. And that one is coming with the south wind from the south US every spring, and they are landing in Canada. And usually they come end of May. Sometimes they come beginning of May, like in 2012 they, come, they came beginning of May. And you have on the screen, so on the far right, uh, adults of the, no, far left, sorry, adult of the leaf hopper, and then the middle is a nymph, and eggs coming from uh, the female leaf hopper. So how uh, Aster yellow is being transmitted? Uh, the leaf hopper is a phloem feeder, and it feeds on infected plants by feeding on the phloem that is already infected. Then the bacteria goes into the gut, multiply in the gut, go into the cavity of the leaf hopper, multiply into the cavity, and goes in the salivary gland. This, depending on the temperature, takes two to four weeks. And uh, what's happening once they are in the salivary gland, when a leaf hopper feed, it poke a hole in the plant um, deep enough so it reaches the phytoplasma, the phloem, sorry, and when it reaches the phloem, it spits some saliva to actually digest a little bit and then suck up the phloem like a slurpee after. And that's how it, infecting, it is infecting the plant with the bacteria. And because the, the uh, bacteria can only be transmitted by the phloem feeder, they cannot be transmitted by soil or they cannot be transmitted by eggs. It's only via the phloem. So what is happening in the field? The, the leaf hopper, when they come, they come in spring. So they come just at the time when the canola is at the seedling level. And they land on what is green because they need to feed. And if they feed uh, on the seedlings, then we might end up by having symptoms. However, the symptoms, you can only see them at the end of August. So you will know if your crop has been infected really badly by Aster yellow only at the end of uh, the season, not at the beginning. And uh, to have really bad infection, it doesn't take much. Three infected leaf hopper, 10 hours, and one plant. That's it. So if they land and they feed on your crop, and if they are all infected and you have a lot of them, they feed on your crop in one night or two days, and that's it. You, have the, you, you will have the Aster yellow in your crop. So, what are the characteristics of those bacteria or phytoplasma, whichever you want to call them? Uh, they actually modify, when they are in the phloem, they modify the expression of the gene of the plants that are responsible for the flower development. So the plant, instead of making flower, the plant is making leaves. So they look a lot greener, a lot more lush, which is why sometimes you don't see the symptom until the end of the season. And the phytoplasma overwinter in the roots of perennial plant, which means that you can have reservoir plant, reservoir, uh, disease reservoir in your perennial plant all around the crop. Also, when a plant or an insect is infected, it is usually infected for life, which is why when we have a lot of leaf hopper coming from the US that are all infected, they will come in Canada and they will stay infected during the whole season. So you have some pictures of um, symptoms. There is uh, one of the pictures is on canola, so you have a healthy canola flower, and then when the pistil start to grow a little bit greener, that's the beginning of the symptom, and then after at the end they form those bladder-like pods that, that are very typical of Aster yellows. And you have also Aster yellows in Echinacea as well as in uh, garlic. So. 
the typical aster yellow symptom are bladder-like pods, as well as misshapen seen uh, seeds. And I don't know if you remember when you had that outbreak of aster yellow in 2012, uh, when there was a combine and you harvested the seeds, the seeds were like dust. And that was coming from uh, the, the plants not making uh, proper seeds. So, wh why are we studying actually Aster yellow? It's not that much of a big issue most of the year. So, most of the years it's less at 0.1% incidence, so it's not a lot. But some years we ended up by having really major issue. The first outbreak, the first recorded outbreak was in 1957, and we had roughly 2 to 10 percent of incidence depending on the field. Then 2000, 2 to 15 percent of plant having the disease. Then 2007, 2 to 25 percent. And then finally, uh, 2012, where we had between 5 and 60 percent of plant that were infected. And some of the uh, field in northern Saskatchewan near Meadow Lake, they had up to 80% of incidence in their crops. So it was a major, major problem. And what happened in 2019, I had some calls and some um, uh, discussion with a few agronomists who were bringing and sending all those plants with really weird symptoms like pod abortion or malformed stems or completely twisted stem or leaves that were not looking like leaves. And everybody telling me, well, this is Aster yellow, this is Aster yellow. And, well, they were not typical symptoms. That was not typical symptom of Aster yellow. But we did indeed test them. And we, um, oops. Yeah, we, we uh, did test them. And they were all, not all, 80% were actually infected with Aster yellow. Now, does that mean that those atypical symptoms were actually caused by Aster yellow? That we don't know. But all in all, they were all, uh, they were at 80% infected with uh, the phytoplasma. So the big question is, uh, what are the exact typical symptoms? What are the production losses, the real production losses due to Aster yellow? What are the atypical symptoms from 2019? Where are they coming from? Is this really Aster yellow or something else? And well, we are supposed to have seed treatment. And do they actually protect the plant against the leaf hopper, or do they not protect it against the leaf hopper? So in order to do that, uh, we use some bioassays. So we do a lot of bioassays in the lab. And uh, the protocol of this bioassay has been developed by Bob Elliott, who was working on seed treatment uh, for uh, flea beetles. And we use the exact same um, bioassay. So we basically put the plant, in we grow plant in little cone, we put a little cage on top, and then we put the leaf hopper in it. And we tried various uh, growth uh, stage and various uh, soil moisture, the really wet soil and uh, dry soil. And we leave the leaf hopper for only 10 hours. Again, so keep that number in mind, only 10 hours. And we remove the leaf hopper and then put the plants in the gr uh, greenhouse and we wait. And then we check with PCR if we have the phytoplasma, the bacteria in the plant, or we wait for symptoms. And as soon as we put the leaf hopper, they go on the canola right away. They feed within minutes. So they are pretty efficient in feeding on the canola. And we develop a rating scale for uh, Aster yellow symptoms. So on the left side, you have the check. And then you have rating one, where you only have a little bunch on top of bladder-like pods. And then rating two, you have just maybe 20% of the plant, 20% of the plant that has little pods. The rating three is half of the pods are gone, and it's only bladder-like uh, symptoms. Rating four, there is absolutely no more pods whatsoever. And rating five is what I call the bonsai because the plant is very small and it's only green and there is no more pods, no more flower, nothing left. And that's what is happening in terms of the seeds. So when you look at the seeds, on the top is a healthy one, you have normal looking seeds. And then uh, for the rating one to three, you have development of abnormal seeds and normal seeds, but the normal seeds are a lot smaller, they are shriveled and they weigh less. And at the bottom, you don't even have any seeds. It's just a bladder-like pod, and when you open the bladder, it's just uh, some kind of green tissue growth, and that's about it. 
And when you look at the seed yield, if you um, look at the uh, seed yield for one plant and then the 1,000 seed weight, as soon as you reach level two, which, which is just a, a bunch of uh, bladder-like pods at the tip of the branches, meaning you don't always see it, you have already lost most of the yield of the plant because you are even below uh, two grams per plant. Now, if you compare wet soil versus uh, dry soil, uh, when you look at the number of leaf hoppers per plant and the, seed, the acer yellow rating in wet soil, as soon as you reach three to four leaf hoppers per plant for 10 hours, you have already passed the rating two. So you have already lost your plant and your crop. In dry soil, it's completely different. If the plant is grown in dry soil, you can put 16 or even 20 leaf hoppers per plant. You won't even reach uh, rating one. So dry soil, even if the leaf hoppers are infected, they can feed on the plant, you won't get symptoms. So um, now, why is there a difference between wet and dry soil? How come, what's happening? And what is happening is that when we look at the leaf hopper, when we put them in the plant, on the plant, in the cage, if the plants are grown in dry soil, the leaf hopper don't like it. If they are grown in wet soil, the leaf hopper like it, because in dry soil, only seven, 59 to 70 percent of the leaf hopper will go on the plant, but they don't seem to feed. They walk along, they poke, they go somewhere else, they poke again, but they don't seem to feed, while when they are on the wet soil, they actually stay and they feed. And one of the experiments that I'm not showing here because I didn't have time, if it is cold and wet, because we put the cages at 10 degrees and at 4 degrees, if it is cold and wet, they stay and they feed, and they don't even move from the plant. So the coldest and the wettest, the worst uh, for, the, for the Aster yellow disease. And also when the soil is dry, the bacteria inside the plant seems to have difficulty to multiply, so they just don't uh, do the symptoms. Uh, now, when we, try to, uh, when we try to see if there was a difference between inoculation at early stage versus inoculation at later stage, meaning after pre-bolting and bolting, what you can see is that the percentage of plant with typical Aster yellow symptom, meaning the bladder-like pods, it's very high in early stage. Even in dry soil, we still have 38% that shows some kind of symptoms. While if the inoculation is done in late stage, there is barely any symptom. If it's dry soil, there is no symptom at all. If it is in wet soil, you still have 6% of plant showing symptom, but not that much. So, the, the, the goal, the message to take at the end regarding only the typical Aster yellow symptom is if the leaf hopper are very infected, they come early stage of the canola growth. If the soil is wet and if it is cold, you'll have a lot of issues. While if it's the opposite way around, you, don't, you won't have that many issues. Now, what's happening with all those atypical symptoms that um, that we had this year in 2019. So I received symptoms of uh, chlorosis, germinated seeds in the pod, there was some really uh, weird twist, and a lot of pod abortion. Now, all those, uh, and yeah, and again those uh, fasciated um, uh, leaves, uh, condensed stem, and aborted malformed uh, buds. Now, most of those, symptoms, those atypical symptoms, uh, I've seen some in the bio results, but I've always been careful to discard them because they were not typical of Aster yellow. So what I did is that I went back to the data and I looked for any correlation that I could find between some of the um, atypical symptoms that I found and noted on the, on the notebook, but that I never really kept in mind or that I've never used in the data that I just presented before. And I tried to find some correlation between, between all those atypical symptoms. So let's talk about the pod abortion because pod abortion is the one that I've seen quite often in the bio essay but that I've never uh, keep in mind. So what I did is that I looked first at the control and if I put the um, uh, plants, uh, if I look at the control meaning the plants on which I did not put any leaf hopper, 
I still have 61% of plants in my bioassay in the lab that have pod abortion when it is grown in dry soil as compared to 25% uh, when it is grown in wet soil. So even control check plant have pod abortion, some form of pod abortion. So the interesting result is that I could not find any correlation between the percentage of plant that show pod abortion with either the number of leaf hopper per, the, per plant or whether it was early or late growth stage. Now, if I look at severe pod abortion, meaning more than 50% of the pods were aborted and you still had kind of 50% of your pods that are looking normal. There I found a correlation. When you have a severe pod abortion, if uh, the inoculation is done in wet soil and early stage, you have 6% of the plant that will show pod abortion and in wet soil, 10%. So you can still, um, so one, one of the conclusions of that is that severe pod, pod abortion could actually be caused by Aster yellow. We need confirmation, but it is a possibility. Not high potential, not high possibility, only six or 10%, but it's still one because I've never seen severe pod abortion in the bioassay, in the control, or in the check. Uh, also, again, for uh, pod abortion, uh, the, the percentage of plants who shows uh, pod abortion are usually much higher when inoculation, again, is done in wet soil and at early stage, also with weakly infected leaf hopper. One of the tests that we, regular, uh, that we do on a regular basis is that we check if the leaf hopper are actually really infected. And one of the experiments, we had leaf hopper that were not infected because we mixed up the cages. And pod abortion is actually very common when you use weakly infected leaf hopper. As you can see, you have almost 85% of the plants that show pod abortion as compared to 14% uh, that shows typical symptom. So what is happening is that when you have inoculation, early inoculation, or inoculation at early stage with leaf hopper that are not that infected, then instead of having the full typical symptom, you just have pod abortion. Now, how about the malformed green buds? So those one, I only see them in infected plants. So those ones are really typical also of Aster yellow, and usually they develop into bladder-like pox. Now in 2019, they didn't. So they seem to stay as is and to not, not move. And so when we um, uh, look at in the bioassay, when we look at the PCR test that we did on the plant that shows those green malformed bugs, we again had low titer on phytoplasma. So those green malformed births cease to be caused by Aster yellow, but only either by weakly infected leaf hopper or when the phytoplasma do not develop properly in the plant. But those are caused by Aster yellow. Chlorosis, I always found them also in the bioassay in uh, Aster yellow infected plant, but those can be caused also by other stresses. So I would not say that chlorosis is typical of Aster yellow. That's not the case, but it is very common. So in terms of other, of all the typical, atypical symptoms uh, that we found in 2019, so the malformed green bugs, yes, it's caused by Aster yellow. Pod abortion and chlorosis, yeah, it is also caused by Aster yellow, but that can also be caused by other stress, except the severe, severe pod abortion that I have not seen in check in the bio but I have seen that in the field and in the field they were not necessarily infected with Aster yellow, so it might be caused also by other um, stresses. All the other atypical symptoms, like empty pods, germinated seeds in pod, condensed flower, flattened stem, I've never seen those in uh, the bio -essay. They were infected with Aster yellow, the one that I received from the field, but I don't think they are caused by Aster yellows. Now, seed treatment. Well, we have seed treatment, we had the bio -essay and we did some tests with using the seed treatment. So are they actually protecting the, the plants from the leaf hopper? Uh, again, we use the same style, dry soil, wet soil, uh, cold temperature, hot temperature, and we check the leaf hopper mortality and the aster yellow incidence. And when we use 
uh, dry soil, untreated dry soil and uh, untreated wet soil, they really didn't kill a lot of lifopur. Uh, we, we look at the lifopur 24 hours after putting them on the plant and untreated one didn't really kill a lot of lifopur. However, the neonicotinoid treated seeds uh, were removing most of the lifopur and killing most of the lifopur within 24 to 72 hours. In dry soil, that was a lot less efficient in wet soil. And that is reflected by the percentage of plant with Aster yellow. Uh, when we look at the ne uh, neonic treated seeds, uh, the Aster yellow infected plant uh, that were uh, treated with the neonic, we didn't have any uh, symptoms. There was absolutely none of them, zero. And when we look in wet soil, we still had some uh, Aster yellow infected plant. So the seed treatment are efficient, yeah, because they did reduce quite a bit the, uh, the symptoms, the Aster yellow symptoms on the plant, but they are not as efficient as in dry soil. So basically for um, inoculation done at early growth stage, the lifopur are controlled by seed treatment within 24 hours, they, they die, uh, and the Aster yellow symptoms are reduced but the seed treatment are a lot more efficient in dry soil as compared to wet soils. So in conclusion, the, the typical Aster yellow symptoms are the bladder-like pods, the green malformed flowers, and some of the atypical like severe pod abortion and cl uh, chlorosis can be caused by Aster yellow, but by also by other stresses. And inoculation, when it is done early in the season, and in wet soil, and moreover also in cold temperature, this is really bad because the leaf hopper have plenty of time to actually um, uh, to inoculate the disease. And the seed treatment work less efficiently when it is wet. Uh, economic threshold for early growth stage in dry soil, it's 12 leaf hopper or plus per plant. In wet soil, it's only three leaf hopper, 10 hours, one plant. So it's really fast. And the seed treatment in the case of this presentation, I only presented the one with Elix Extra, but we did a whole bunch of others, and it is more or less the same results. It's a lot more efficient in dry soil as compared to wet soil, but it still gives some protection. And with that, I would like to acknowledge some of the funding agency and my collaborators, uh, like Tyler Wist and Bob Elliott and Tim DeMonceau, Dana and Christine, and if you have question, I'll gladly take the question. Thanks very much, Crystal. Very good presentation. I'm surprised. I, I, I had always thought that Aster Yellows were a very minor incidence and you couldn't do much about them and we shouldn't worry about them. I'm surprised by the, the yield losses because most of the canola crops would have seed treatment on them. So you're, you're getting pretty large losses reported, even probably with, with uh, crops that had seed treatment on them. Yeah, in 2012, uh, when there was a big outbreak, uh, if uh, you remember, at least in Saskatchewan, the spring was wet and cold. So the leaf hopper and the leaf hopper came the first week of May instead of the last two weeks of May. And so they, they came, they sit on the little piece of green that they could find, the seedlings, of canola seedlings as well as cereal seedlings too, because cereal were affected also in 2012. And they were just standing there and the canola seedlings were sitting ducks, basically, and staying as a seedlings for several days, if not weeks, while it was cold and getting inoculated. Is it uh, economic importance on other crops as well, or is canola a primary uh, target? You mean f in field crops? Field crops, uh, yeah, but pulse crops? Pulse crop? No, not no? that much. No, no, it's mostly vegetables, carrots, okay. and uh, a lot of the vegetables that are grown. Yeah. Okay, I've seen it in my, my mustard crops, I guess, but that's again it's, the brassica yeah, family. Yeah, it's not a lot in mustard because it's so hairy. They well, the yellow like mustard is, but brown yeah. mustard is oh, not so yeah. hairy. Okay. okay, but anything that is hairy, yeah, they don't like it. Can we predict when the leaf hoppers are coming up in the, on the southern winds? Is there any monitoring program that yes, would be possible? Yes, the, there is. Tyler and I are working on trying to develop an early warning system to actually see when they are coming and then rush in the field, pick up some, uh, some leaf hopper. And we have now that molecular tool that will tell us uh, within 30 minutes if the leaf hopper are infected or not, and we can do that in the field. 
and if we manage to put all together the wind trajectory and the traps, the result of the trap, and go in the field, pick up the, the leaf hopper and have the test, we should be able to say pretty fast okay. if keep, they are Keep close to that not. mic, Crystal, oh. they're getting hard to hear. The D, uh, is there any potential then for controlling, if we knew the leaf hoppers were arriving, to uh, plan a fullier insecticide application to reduce them? Is, do you think there's any merit to that? Um, it depends how bad they are infected. If they are all infected, I would, yeah, well, I, I can't really give an advice, but I would probably spray, but I'm not supposed to give advice on spraying. That's up to the growers to decide. Uh, but if they are all infected, knowing that only three leaf hopper per plant and 10 hours is enough to inoculate, but That's your, your window of application might be pretty pretty small, although they, they, they don't just all arrive at a particular day. It's probably waves of them. Uh, in 2012, they all arrived in two days. Is that right? Yeah, so that was one big wind, and they arrived with a diamondback moss, and there was also some uh, monarch butterfly, and there, there was a, a big south wind coming uh, from the south US. So the timing is about the same as diamondback moths then? Yes, and that we are actually using some of the trap uh, for diamond back moss as also trap for the leaf hopper because they are all coming at the same time. Cool. Questions for Crystal? Yeah. Like that. Um, I'm just wondering with your data on the wet versus dry soil, how that impacts uh, early irrigation? I haven't done any study on irrigation but yeah that's a very good question i should look at all the data that we had with outlook in outlook in the irrigated area because um yeah some the, in 2012 some of the irrigated area were pretty hardly uh, um, impacted by aster yellows yeah any other questions for crystal is the reach matter because uh, they, they're coming up from the south, so are the southern prairies more prone, or are these wind currents uh, not that discriminatory and, and southern areas aren't that much more concentrated for, for both diamondback moths and the leafhopper? No, actually it, dep it depends on the wind trajectory. Yeah, it can hit. In 2012, the wind went from the south US, went through Manitoba, uh, northern Saskatchewan, and reached northern Alberta. So, and last, this year, yeah, this year it was, it went straight to Saskatchewan and, uh, and Alberta, but there was hardly, there was not too many leaf hoppers. Thank you very much. Fascinating information. And then good luck with your, your future work on it, Crystal.